Hi everybody, I'm Sylvia Hepler, owner and president of Launching Lives LLC, which is a career development specialty company for executives and managers based in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And I'm just thrilled to be back here with you for this fifth and final segment in our mini video series of five that is directly associated with my 12-step blueprint for landing your next job. Whether you're talking about landing that promotion right where you are, or leaving the industry that you're in entirely, or simply going to work for another organization. It doesn't really matter, but we are talking about how to get you into the next job, the job of your dreams, the job that is truly right for you at this point in your life and at this point in your career. And so with that said, let's move on to the content of this particular video. This step in the blueprint is titled Schedule Conversations. Now that's a really odd step, isn't it? It's probably one that you wouldn't necessarily think of. It's one that most people omit from their plan. If they actually create their own plan, it's very rare to see this as one of the actual steps that shows up in their structured plan as they have designed it. You know, usually when people develop a plan, the first thing they think about is, oh yeah, I gotta dig out my resume. I have to find my resume, first of all. I have to get it out of the files, out of the file drawer at home, or out of the electronic files, and then I need to polish it. I need to bring it up to date, and then I need to think about how can I prepare for interviews? And then I need to think about what companies and organizations would I consider working for and why would I want to work for them? And what's my skill set? What can I offer them? You know, those are all the obvious considerations. Those are all the things that most people think they need to do when they start considering a formal job search. Well, as you know, I have this 12-step program and I haven't revealed all of those steps. In this video series, I have chosen to reveal five. But as I was strategically considering which of those five I would select to share with you and dig deeper in, I decided that I was gonna choose schedule conversations as one of those, mainly because it is not a typical consideration. It is not a step that most people think about proactively. And if they do in fact think about it, which is few and far between, but if they do think about it, a lot of times they will ignore it. They will minimize its impact and its importance and they will convince themselves that they can just step over that particular activity, that they don't have to do it. When in fact, I'm here to tell you that it has equal weight in my 12 step process because I believe it is critically important. Let me share with you why. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what kind of conversations are we talking about in the first place? And then who are we gonna have these conversations with? Well, the kind of conversations that I'm talking about are strategically planned conversations with people who are already in the kinds of jobs or even the specific job that you are looking to land. And the purpose of this is so that you can get an inside view into that particular line of work, into that particular job, into that position and how it fits within the rest of the organization or the team or the department. It's really about getting that kaleidoscopic view of the position. And what is it really, really gonna be like? Not is it like what's happening for me in my mind, in my fantasy world. You know, as I play this out in my head and I envision what every day is gonna be like there, doing that line of work, with maybe those people at that organization, as I play out that fantasy, 
you need to be talking with folks who aren't playing out any kind of a fantasy anymore. They're actually living that reality of that particular job, of that particular line of work with that organization. And they can tell you up close and personal what the real deal is. So you might want to consider this particular step in my blueprint, the scheduling conversations, as the opportunity to learn about the real deal. Now, what constitutes the real deal? Let's dig a little deeper into all this. Well, you actually want to send emails to these people who you have strategically chosen. Maybe they are friends, maybe they are previous colleagues, maybe these are people you've researched online, maybe they've been referred to you by a friend or a family member, regardless. But you want to actually schedule conversations with them. Conversations on the phone, or better yet, if they're rather close by geographically, conversations in person at a coffee shop, depending on their work, Maybe you can actually drive to their place of employment, meet with them in their office or their workspace. But preferably, you are going to have a direct conversation with them, not necessarily emails back and forth, although if that's the best you can get, that's certainly better than nothing. But I still recommend the face-to-face -face visit or being on the telephone and having a live, real-time, serious strategic conversation about tell me what your work is like, what you are experiencing it to be. So you want to organize a set of questions and you know what? I'm going to make your job easy. I'm going to give you what I think all of those questions need to be. Now you may think of other questions and I certainly invite you to think of other ones. Be my guest. Add them to your list. But these are the ones that I have come up with that I think are absolutely essential when you actually get that person in front of you. Let's start with, I would suggest you ask them, why did they even take that job in the first place? What attracted them in particular to that line of work? What attracted them to that position? And that position's place within the company or business why did they want that job at that place working for that person or group of people? And what is it that they think they brought to the table from day one? This is actually the passion-focused question, I think. I didn't write the word passion there, but I could have. Because I think it is the passion-focused question. What was it that had them so juiced and jazzed to actually want and take that particular job. I would start there. And then I would move to asking them how long they have been there. Because you know, there's a difference between, well, I've been here for six months, and I just got off of probation, and well, I've been here for three years, or I've been here for two years, or I've been here for five or 10 or 15 years. You know, the time frame actually makes a difference because people's experiences change over these time frames. And this leads me to suggest to you that, you know, what would be the best case scenario is finding multiple people in that job or something similar who have been at the job for different lengths of time. Like one person who has been there a shorter length of time, somebody there who's been there maybe a year, and then somebody who's been there for say four or five years and get these different perspectives. I would also suggest that you ask, what skills did they need in order to, number one, get the job, and number two, to actually keep the job? And those are two different things. I mean, think about that. Sometimes we gloss over that, and we don't really think about it. But it requires a certain set of skills to actually land the job, and then it requires the same set and additional skills to stay in that position. So you want to explore both of those. Ask the person what skill set was required to actually get the attention of the company and the interviewers. And now what set of skills, in addition to the original set, are they finding that they have needed to actually stay in the job 
and do an effective job at that particular position. And then I would ask, what surprises have they had? This is one that people often forget to ask. And I think sometimes it's a little bit of like a Freudian slip because you know what? We don't necessarily want to know the answer to that. We're scared of it. That goes back to our fears. We're a little bit scared of hearing their responses to the surprises that they have encountered. And I don't know of anybody who's taken a job who has not been surprised by something along the way. Unfortunately, I think most of the surprises occur within the first few weeks. And when that happens, it's often because we didn't necessarily do our job right in the interview process. Because the reality is that when we interview well, and that doesn't necessarily just mean answering the interviewer's questions, but that also means us asking the right appropriate questions. When we do our interview job well, then we are less apt to experience surprises, or at least major surprises, or the devastating negative surprises. I'm not saying it can't happen, because there's no infallible interview process. But you're less likely to find the negative surprises if you do what you need to be doing when you're in the interview setting. So while most of the surprises usually occur within the first few weeks, there can be other surprises that rear their heads later down the line, like a few months into the work, or even a year later or several years later. And sometimes that's because personnel change, processes change, regulations change, HR policies change, I mean, you name it. We could wallpaper a room with factors that can enter into causing certain surprises to happen for us. But the name of your game is you want to do due diligence. You want to stay on top of all of this in advance of ever saying yes to a job offer. And you want to do whatever it takes to eliminate the surprises, particularly negative ones, that you want to avoid. And one of the best ways you can do it is simply ask people when you're interviewing them, what surprises did you encounter from the beginning of your employment there all through current day? Tell me about those and the impact they had upon you, good and bad, how they changed you and how they required you to change. Tell me all about that. Moving on to the next question, I would suggest you ask your interviewees what they would change about their current work experience if they could. If they could wave a magic wand, what would they in fact change if it was all up to them and they had the authority and the power to do so? What would they change about their particular job and job description and obligations? What would they change in the culture especially if, if they're working for a company that you think you might want to work for, you want to tease out of them information about the company's culture. What's it really like to work here for them? What's it like to be on board on the payroll and be immersed in this environment day in and day out? You want to also ask how they were blatantly disappointed. Not just surprised, because you know surprises can be good, and surprises can sometimes even be neutral, but disappointments are not neutral, and disappointments are not positive. Disappointments are generally negative, and they put kind of like a damper on us as individuals and even people around us. So I would directly ask them, since you've been working here over the last three years, for example, tell me about disappointments that you have encountered and experienced. Where were you just blown out of the water disappointed? We're talking about the big stuff there. Where were you slightly disappointed? And how did those disappointments impact your work experience? Have those disappointments affected you in such a way that now you're thinking of leaving, even if you haven't mentioned that out loud to anyone yet? Or have they been disappointments that you have been able to manage and absorb You've been able to kind of flow with them, 
revise yourself, revise your approach, your strategies, your ways of doing things, your actions, your style. Talk to me a little bit about those disappointments and their impact. And then, of course, you definitely want to ask them, what kinds of opportunities for growth have they had at this particular organization? Or haven't there been any? Has the employer supported them in taking online or on-site courses? Has their employer supported them in hiring a coach or a mentor? Has their employer actually provided people on-site to mentor them, especially in the beginning of the job experience? Is this an employer who puts money behind resources and materials to help you grow right where you are and then to eventually perhaps get promoted down the line? You also want to ask that person in your interview how his or her job fuels their career trajectory. That means how does this job actually fit into the whole of your career? How is it going to feed your overall career? Is it going to play a role or is it not particularly going to play a role other than it might make you happier? It might give you more peace. It might provide less stress on a daily basis. Or is it really going to be a job that's somewhat critical, that fits very neatly and strategically into the overall long-term direction that you want to take with your career over the next 10 or 20 years? You see, those are, those are really important issues. And, and this leads me to say that it's okay to take a job that doesn't strategically fit in to your overall career. That's perfectly okay. So I don't want you to misunderstand the point that I'm making here. Not every job, especially a job you've decided you're going to take short term, has to fit into the whole trajectory in this major meaningful way. It doesn't have to. Another question that I suggest you ask is, what assumptions had this particular person made before they ever got into the job? And then what assumptions do they find that they're continuing to make as they go along in the job month after month, year after year? And how are those assumptions serving them? Which assumptions are not serving them? And what's the fallout to those negative assumptions? The assumptions that are creating some kind of a block or pulling them down in some way. What's happening around all of that related to assumptions? I would also ask, what has been their level of satisfaction? And, you know, I would get yourself prepared to hear some varying responses there. Because most people's satisfaction is not perfectly linear and unchanging. People go through ups and downs with a job. Think about your own experience. Has it really been beautifully linear for the last five years or even the last year? Probably not, if you're honest. You know, you're going to have some months that you're on a high and you think, wow, it doesn't get any better than this. And then you're going to have some days or weeks or even a few months where you're on a low and you're thinking, gosh, is this really for me? And what am I doing wrong? What can I be doing better? How can I present myself differently? You know, those kinds of things. Maybe you've gone through some failures, some disappointments. Maybe you've made some mistakes, and there's been a price to pay for those. Those are some down and low moments. Most people's job experiences are a combination of these highs and these lows, and then of some neutral ground as well. So I would ask the people you interview, tell me a little bit about your job satisfaction. And if they have been there longer than six months, make sure they're telling you about their highs and their lows, and even their neutral months. And finally, you want to ask the individual you're interviewing, how does this particular job feed your soul? Now, maybe you're not comfortable wording it that way, depending who you're talking to. You know, if you ask that of an accountant or a mathematician, he's going to say, what? What did you just say? Or she is going to say, what did you just say? I'm not, I'm not on your wavelength. What do you mean by that? And they may think you're being silly. So the language is not what's important, but the point of this is whatever language you choose to use with the person you're interviewing, 
make sure you're getting at that issue. Find out why they keep coming back day in and day out. What's keeping them there? What's making them feel like they're making some significant contributions? What's making them feel happy? What's making them feel like something inside of them is being fueled and fed? I'm trying to give you some language here. But you want to find out the answer to that question. Because here's the deal. If they hedge and they're looking all around the room, if you're meeting with them face to face, or you're on the phone with them and there's this big lull in the conversation and everything goes silent, there's a reason for that. And it's because they're grasping at straws to come up with a response as an answer to your question. And if they have to grasp too long and too hard, you know that that job, regardless of how they eventually answer you, you know that that job is not really feeding their soul. Because they had to kind of struggle to come up with an answer to what you just asked. You will know immediately that it's more of just a job to them. And it's not really, really doing something great for them on a very deep level of their humanness, you see. So make sure you don't leave out that last question. And I would suggest you save that question for last. I think it's a a powerful, profound question to save till last. And whatever happens in response is going to be very telling for you. And in fact, if the person is hedging and there's this big silent space, when they finally do start talking, you might want to ask them in a nice, gentle, polite way, gosh, I'm just curious why there was so much time between when I asked the question and when you were able to respond. I'm just curious about that. I would say that. Try to dig a little deeper beneath the surface. What made it take so long for them to give you an answer? Is it because they were trying to come up with something positive to sound good and encouraging to you? Or were they trying to even do some soul searching of their own, reaching deeply inside of themselves to see what in the world is the real answer to that? Because, you know, until you ask that question, maybe they never ask themselves that question. But I would not just accept that silence if you get silence. I would dig into that and find out what took so long for them to come up with a response. Now, as you know from watching all of the previous four videos, you know that I always conclude the video with an assignment for you to do after you disengage from this. And here's your assignment after video number five. I would invite you to identify three to five people who you could talk to who already have jobs that you would like and then schedule those face-to-face or those phone meetings. So first of all, your job is to think about who could you interview and then reach out, connect with those people and actually schedule a time. And if you're wondering, well, Sylvia, how much time should we be talking? How long should we be on the phone, for example? Well, it can vary. And, you know, if you do interview different people, the time is going to vary with each one. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what I think is reasonable, I would think if you could have a solid 15 to 20 minute meaty, meaningful conversation, that that will serve you very, very well. And look at it this way. Whatever you learn from these conversations, you're going to have more information at the end of those than you ever had before you ever had these conversations in the first place. So it's got to be a win for you. I mean, I don't know how you could possibly lose. You're going to learn things that you did not know, or at least you didn't know them factually, before you ever started talking with these individuals. So we have now laid out the five-segment video series. And I'm so proud of you for participating in all five segments. Of course, my deepest core wish for you is that you have learned a lot by engaging here with me in these five different parts. And at this point, what I want to say to you is I've really enjoyed having you join me for these videos. And if you've really liked what you've heard and what you've seen here, that this material has a personal, in-depth meaning for you, and you're really convinced 
now more than ever that you really do want to get a promotion or you want to fly the coop and you want to work elsewhere or even completely change industries and you think that perhaps I have some good stuff to offer you through my 12-step blueprint, I would invite you to just send me an email at sylvia at launchinglives.biz. I encourage you strongly to send me an email and you and I can set up a time to get on the phone and talk about what would it be like for us to do some work together because there are different options for that. So take care everybody and I hope to hear from you really soon.